Chasing your piercer, part one, verification. Going to go over how you can kind of verify whether or not the person that you're thinking about getting pierced by is who they say they are. Coming up next on Body Piercing Basics, episode number 99. So you should probably stick around. For those that are new to the channel, first off, welcome to the channel. I hope you're enjoying the videos, and I hope you find these informative. But you may not know who I am or whether or not you should even listen to me. My name is Davo. I'm a professional body piercer and have been since 1994. I own and operate the Axiom Body Piercing Studio, located right here in Des Moines, Iowa, inside Skin Kitchen Tattoo. So... When I talk to you about these things, I tell you a level of expertise that comes from being in the body piercing industry for well over 26 years. What I'm going to talk about today is choosing your piercer. Now, there might be a lot of different reasons why you are in that situation, but it is one of the most common questions I get asked. I either, you know, something either you're new to piercing, and that's understandable. Um, and, and like when people have bad experience of piercers, they always feel like they're, you know, like, Oh my God, I'm just such an idiot. No, you didn't know better. So here's a way for you to know better. Um, also, you know, it could be a situation where your piercer either moved away or they, they stopped piercing, they've retired or, you know, you've moved. So you're in, you're looking for somebody or maybe you didn't have good results from the last one. So you're out there looking for the piercer that's right for you. I'm going to try to give you some basic understanding of some of the things you should look for and how to kind of get through this process and guide you through it. This is the first one of two because I decided it was too long. Uh, we're going to talk about verification today and how you can verify whether or not that person is who they say they are or who they're representing themselves as. First thing with verification that we should talk about is that pretty much anybody that decides they're a professional piercer, can put up a shingle and a sign and print out some business cards and say they're a professional piercer. There's no third party organization that's going to verify that they are who they say they are or they have any skills or what have you. There's not any governing board that's of any type of, uh, you know, government level. I guess would be the best way to put it. You're not, they're not going to be investigated for piercing without a license, though that's possible, and I'll get to that. But, I mean, in the way that we think of doctors, uh, there's not going to be malpractice suits. So, basically, it's kind of a buyer's beware market. However, there's a lot of things you can look for, and I'm going to go through some of those. The biggest thing is to understand there is not no magic mountain somewhere that – the, the people walk up and the piercing wizards stand there and decide who is a piercer and who is not a piercer. There is a lot of different paths that you can take to becoming a professional piercer. Um, there's the right way, there's the wrong way, there's this way, there's that way. But you need to understand that it doesn't matter where you're going, you kind of need to research the person who's doing the piercing. Now let's talk about licensing. Uh, depending on where you're at, there might be regulations or legislation regarding body piercing. Now that varies greatly from city, state, county, country, commonwealth, island. It really depends on what's going on there. Usually what the licensing mainly involves is protecting the general public from disease, meaning they are more concerned with making sure that the person has some type of training in cross-contamination prevention, that they have uh, a proper setup to ensure there's not a transfer of infectious materials to a human um, that may spread a virus or cause other problems. Um, they, they usually will come in and do an inspection. It's usually by somebody from the health department that usually inspects restaurants and may not really completely understand what's going on. But that's it. Um, if you see a license on the wall, that's pretty much what it means. has no verification the person has received any type of training, that they have any skills, any experience, what have you. It just says they met these requirements. It's the same thing with tattooing in most states. Now, with that said, 
if it is regulated in your state, they need to have a license. That that would be a giant red flag that, no, oh, you don't want to be here. Um, if it's a van down by the river or a tent on the beach, probably not licensed, just to let you know. The next thing is there's no college of body piercing or body art or tattooing. Um, there are some that offer these type of uh, uh, training things, but the thing is is that the really the only way that you would learn to properly pierce is through an apprenticeship. It's much like, I always look at it this way, um, college, and I'll talk about seminars too, these are kind of like, going to college like you're going to medical school not saying it's that complicated or that difficult what i'm saying is is, is i'm using it as an example so you're finishing medical school and part of the tail end of that is doing residency with piercing you do that kind of learning period um sometimes some people require you to go to uh some type of instructional course or what have you then you go through the period of time where you're being supervised as you do the piercings and practice the art uh, there is a great deal that needs to be learned by actually doing it you can't just learn this from a book or a video or what have you plenty of people try and there's plenty of terrible results because of it so uh just understand that uh, school no that doesn't mean anything Next thing is, is all professional organizations are voluntary. Now, uh, probably the one that most people will talk about when it comes to piercing is the Association of Professional Piercers. Now, uh, it is voluntary to be a member. It is something that you have to pay an annual dues for. They do require you to go through some basic steps and hoops to get to the point where you become a member. Now, that includes... Uh, some certification that you have the basic needs to back to that cross-contamination prevention thing that state boards do, our state government does. Um, the next thing is that some verification that you are an experienced piercer um, in that or that you are an apprentice or been through an apprenticeship. Generally, uh, I think the other thing is is they have that you stock the proper jewelry, that it's all body certified in plant grade. Now, uh, just uh, I, there's a lot of people out there that'll go, oh, it's an APP member. Uh, they do piercings and angel wings pop out of their back and everything comes off perfect. It heals in 30 minutes. Just because they're a member of the APP does not mean they are experienced or have skills. It means that they've taken a step and joined an organization. Um, an, an organization that has two primary goals, and that is education and also expanding litigation from state to state, um, or le legislation, not litigation, legislation, and kind of being a support group for piercers. Now, uh, it is no certification that the person that is works there or the, what have you can do anything. They just know, but they, they don't know. Now, a lot of piercers out there are not members of the APP, including myself. It has nothing against the APP. I'm not going to talk bad about them. I don't. I have my own personal reasons why I do not want to be a member, and I have my own professional reasons why I don't want to be a member. I um, mean, part of it comes back to my standard belief that I can uh, pass this wisdom on from uh, Groucho Marx. I wouldn't join a club that would have me as a member. Now let's talk about seminars. Uh, seminars get you certificates on the wall and all that fun stuff, but... Once again, they are not designed to get you in a point where you're professionally piercing. Most of the seminars kind of have two main focuses. The first one being as a precursor to starting an apprenticeship. It gives you kind of a knowledge base to work off of. The second one is continuing uh, education in very specific uh, ways or reinfor reinforcing or re-educating uh, somebody that's been working professionally for a long period of time. They, maybe they've been working by themselves and they need to expand their, their knowledge and their techniques. So it's in no way, shape, or form saying that they know what they're doing or that they're skilled. Most of these seminars are like four, we, four to seven days long. You can't learn to pierce in four to seven days. I'm sorry. Apprenticeship is what I generally suggest uh, when you're learning to pierce. 
Uh, nothing replaces it. It is generally what it is, is an observation and education period, followed by slowly beginning to pierce yourself under supervision. You learn a lot about uh, techniques, uh, safety, cross-contamination prevention, of course, um, anatomy, placement, jewelry types, materials, etc. It is a thing that you cannot pick up overnight. With some people, it can last a very long time, and most of them have an apprentice program that's set up to allow checking out on certain piercings and getting people on their own. For example, right now, I have an apprentice named Shannon. She has been apprenticing since November. She is in no way, shape, or form ready to be pretty much unleashed, unsupervised on the general public. That's going to take a little bit while longer. She is progressing nicely, and I do think she has some skill, but it's not there yet. One of the things with apprenticeship is it can be hard to verify whether or not the person did it. Of course, you could ask them who they apprenticed under and contact that person but it really depends on what their relationship was like when they left that apprenticeship. Uh, it may have been bad blood by the time they left. It may have been a great situation. The person may have been ready to get rid of them. It's really hard to say. But at least knowing whether or not they did, in fact, go through the apprenticeship is a huge step forward as far as finding somebody that's skilled and knowledgeable and knows what they're doing. Now let's talk about uh, images, reviews, and references. Here's how this goes. Uh, images should be, especially those that are in their portfolio that are featured, should be photos of piercings that are healed. Anybody can do a straight piercing, put a pretty piece of jewelry in it, spend 20 minutes cleaning it up, and take a photograph of it. It's another thing to give somebody the support they need, the information they need, et cetera, to heal out a piercing that they've done correctly. Uh, you should always ask whether or not they're healed or not. Sometimes it can be difficult to know the difference. Mainly what you want to look for is if there's purplish areas around it, because that usually means that whatever they use to mark it is still there. Um, if the piercing is flat, it doesn't tuck inward, the piercing holes. Um, if it seems like it's swollen or there's redness, etc., generally that means the piercing was just done. Now, uh, the other, it's, it's fine if piercers want to put in photos of things they're proud of that they just did, maybe post them on Instagram, but if they really want to show their skill level, they're going to wait until the piercing is healed, then take the photo. It's a better understanding of what the process has been like and what the outcome is. It's more important to you to know that they can do that and heal it out, especially if it's difficult piercings to heal or do, or it is piercings that are notorious for having issues. If they have uh, healed examples, of that that's a great example of what that person's capable of and what they are going to lead you as far as education and uh, getting to that outcome that we all want a well-heeled fun beautiful piercing now uh, i want to talk a little bit about reviews reviews especially online reviews as somebody who owns a business as somebody who answers reviews who looks at them who's notified every single time somebody reviews me I've learned a couple things. The first thing is, is that most people only write a review within roughly the first hour after getting the piercing done. It's more about the piercing experience. It has nothing to do with how the piercing healed, um, what their experiences were after the piercing was done, um, and anything else in between. It's more about were they nice, were they professional, did I feel like I got what I paid for, um, was it a clean place? That sort of thing. The other thing is, it's just my experience that people either give one-star reviews or five-star reviews. It's usually one or the other. Um, also, that people write reviews tend to do them more often if they've had a negative experience or didn't get along with the person. Sometimes it could just come down to something as simple as that person rubbed me the wrong way or that person said I didn't want to do this or didn't believe that the customer's always right or they feel like they were slided in one shape or another. That could be more of a personality conflict than actually anything to do with the piercing, the piercer, or the studio. 
Just always keep that in mind. Read both the positive and the negative. Also, another thing to look for is, especially with negative reviews, is did the studio respond? Did they try to fix the matter? Did they offer suggestions to fix the matter? Did they offer refunds? Did they offer uh, possibly redoing a piercing or replacing jewelry? Or did they just simply go dark? Didn't say anything. Didn't try to do anything to make the situation right. Lastly, references. References can be kind of hard to get. Uh, probably the most common one is you're sitting there in the supermarket uh, buying groceries and somebody in the aisle or somebody in front of you or behind you has a fresh piercing or a piercing that's visible and you go, where'd you get that done at? Now, they may respond positively. They may respond negatively. You need to understand that most of them, including myself, get asked a lot. Uh, it really depends on the amount of time I have or the free time or if I'm in a hurry or I'm with people or what have you. But generally, I, I love piercing and I love talking about it. Um, and, and I'll get into some of the things you should ask them uh, a, a little bit later. Um, other forms of references that I think work are more of a, a personal level. Ask your friends, family, uh, associates, people you work with, anybody that you have contact with that you can verify that they're a reliable source. Ask them who does their piercings, what their experience was like, etc. Um, the other thing is, is posting on social media. If you post on Facebook or Instagram or somewhere where you have a large friend base, of people you trust and people you know, they're going to give you probably fairly honest answers about their experiences with various different piercers in your area. The things I would suggest covering with a uh, with a reference is what the piercing process was like, uh, what type of jewelry selection they had, and what type of jewelry do they stock. Did it seem like it was enough or a little or what have you, or was the quality really, really poor? Next thing is, did they give them a consultation before they did the piercing? This is very important. You should ask for one that covers the wrists, um, covers what you're going to need to do to heal it, and anything else that might be involved with that particular piercing, including checking the anatomy of, or your anatomy for that piercing, and knowing whether or not you can get it at all before they do the piercing. Not two months later when it's rejecting or has some other problem, they suddenly tell you, oh, yeah, that's common with those. They should volunteer this information so that you can take an educated decision on whether or not the piercing is worth it. The last thing you should ask uh, references is, were they supportive? Uh, did, if you, did they have a problem? Were, were they quick to answer? Did they answer their emails? Did they answer messages? Did they answer the phone? Uh, when they went back to have the jewelry changed, did they charge them? Did they offer a lot of different ideas? Were they very open and educational and helpful in the process? Uh, one thing about aftercare I forgot to mention is they should offer uh, – written instructions, and they should go through it verbally or like right now during the pandemic, offer a video that you can watch to be fully informed on how to properly take care of it. Well, that's the end of part one. Part two will be next week, next Friday, so stay tuned for that. Until um, then, if you like the video, give me a thumbs up. Let me know that you liked it because we like it when you like it. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Hit the notification bell so that you're notified every single time we post something. Check out our merch store. Link is in the description. Lots of different things to choose from. Until next time, here's hoping all your piercings heal with ease and without a single issue. And if you're in the Des Moines, Iowa area, I hope to see if your body piercing needs in the future. Have a good day, everybody. Take care. Take care of your piercings. And we'll see you in the next video.